All right, it looks like we're live right now. Um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, and welcome to today's webcast uh, Q&A series from BNS. Um, my name is Warren Coos, and I'm the high brass product specialist for Buffet Crampon USA. Um, today, we're gonna go over a lot of things uh, with in regards to BNS and their trumpets and the historic value uh, therein. And um, so I just want to welcome you to today's uh, webcast. It's all part of our uh, Together at Home program. And, um, and I'm so happy to, uh, to see everyone here today. And, uh, and hopefully you can really learn some valuable information from, from today's session and our past sessions and also uh, anything we have going on in the future. Uh, yeah, so welcome to everyone uh, throughout the the, the world here um, as we're live here on Facebook. Um, I just wanted to, to say happy Easter to those who are who were able to celebrate over the weekend. Uh, we know these are troubling times and very, very strange times indeed, uh, but wanted to, to extend some of that stuff to you, but um, also create some really great content in, in, the, in the meantime, uh, while we have so much time at home. Uh, as you can see, I am actually at home. Uh, this is my what used to be my dining room and now a quasi office from from home. Um, Buffet Crampon USA has been closed uh, and has been for about four weeks now. Uh, Buffet Crampon USA uh, headquarters is here in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and we are uh, 12 brands uh, strong, so we, we take care of BNS as well as 11 other brands, as you see behind me on the banner. But um, yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you today. I want to go through a few announcements, but then we want to really dive deep into the content today. So uh, please bear with me. This is going to be really, really great um, today, spending time with you. If you have any comments, please uh, make sure you, you make them known in the comments section. Uh, or any questions, any concerns, anything that I can address while we're here live. Um, if I miss them, I'm very sorry. I uh, will get to them in the next day or so, or maybe after after we're live. Um, and even if you're watching this from as it's taped, and you know it will be recorded and uh, readily available on our BNS Facebook page. So, uh, yeah, uh, together at home is a great program we put together. Uh, it's actually. A uh, great thing that we've been able to produce some of our artists' content, right? So creating some great concerts um, from, and these are based all in our uh, Paris showroom in, in France. But um, we've been really kind of expanding that line, expanding this program into being a lot more global. Uh, and uh, stay tuned for some great content, not only from some of the artists in the United States and other areas of the world, but also some grand, brand new webcasts that we've uh, we've come. This is our third session, of course, uh, but we've we've done some great work with the buffet clarinets. I implore you to look at those uh, from last week, and also uh, BNS tubas. We did uh, something on this very page last Thursday, and um, yeah, I encourage you to take a look at that if you are a uh, tuba player, low brass guy. It's great information there. And if you have any questions, just comment in the uh, in the comments there too. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll, great. This this is supposed to really create a, a great opportunity for us to connect with you, and um, and and really get uh, get some some knowledge into your hands. Some hopefully it's educational uh, based and also helps you um, helps you in some way, shape, or form. But really, we just want to connect with you and create something that might be uh, interesting or, or a likely um, welcomed distraction from, from our everyday, which is a little bit uh, troubling. So um, with that said, uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew if you are in the saxophone realm, we're actually going to do another one on Thursday uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard or Eastern Daylight Time. Um, and that's going to be hosted on our Buffet Crampon uh, Facebook page, and it's going to be hosted by our woodwind product specialist, my good friend and colleague, Matt Vance. Um, he's going to be really going deep into the details of the differences between the models between uh, Buffet Crampon saxophones and Cogworth saxophones. So uh, really great info there. He's a very accomplished uh, 
jazz saxophonist in, in town. And um, if I'm remembering correctly, he's also uh, got a, a Grammy, Grammy nomination uh, to his name. So uh, really great stuff. You're going to want to stick around for that. Okay, BNS Trumpets. I'm really excited to delve, dive deep into this um, with you all. So thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. Um, BNS stands for Black Blas und Signal Instrumenten Fabrik. Uh, this is roughly translated from German, of course, and it means brass and signal instruments. Um, we've been making brass instruments for 250 years. So uh, signal instruments were where we started. Uh, we were making them for the military bands back in the 1700s, and it's been uh, kind of a, a really great journey uh, ever since then. Um, so yeah, some, some great stuff happening there. Um, and yeah, so we started making, uh, hunting horns and some, some really, uh, interesting, everything was done on horseback and, and everything. So we still make or have, have made a lot of those for novelty items, uh, in the past or in the recent past, but, um, over the, over time we've moved with the industry in a way that's been more geared towards what you know, what we all know as concert based uh, brass instruments. So um, trumpets, tubas, trombones, uh, great, great stuff throughout the throughout the time, our time here. Yeah, so um, great. The next thing I wanted to talk about has everything to do with where we make our instruments. So I mentioned that our company is uh, German, right? So uh, we are, make our instruments 100% in Germany. There are no elements to our trumpets that are made elsewhere, right? So, um, so we're a 100% made in-house entity, and it's made in this little town called Markenkirchen. Uh, Markenkirchen is a small, as I said, small town on the east end of Germany. And uh, man, it's a, it's a really kind of eclectic and iconic town uh, located in what they call over there the Wuchland area or region, um, which has huge uh, iconic um, value in the music industry. It's, uh, its culture is just based around, around music. So uh, some really good stuff there. Um, and, and so our, our base of headquarters is in Markenkirchen as far as um, where we facilitate and produce all of our instruments. Um, and, and that, that's just a, a great site. If you're ever in Germany and, and find yourself kind of needing something to do, that is really great. Uh, we are right on the border of another country. Um, and I implore you to actually kind of look this up because it's really interesting. It actually speaks to some of my heritage. In fact, um, my name actually comes from Bohemia, uh, Kus, K-U-S. Uh, uh, it actually comes from Bohemia, so it kind of speaks to me a little bit more about uh, about my heritage and the heritage of these trumpets um, and, and BNS instruments in general. But uh, yeah, so um, I mentioned we are 250 years old, um, actually more than we've been making instruments for more than 50, 250 years. And yeah, um, what's interesting is we've taken a lot of the modern techniques and modern technologies to make our instruments. And then when it comes to the tubes, the lead pipes and the and the lead and the, uh, the valve casing and everything that we've moved with the times in every single aspect to try and have a great mix of modern technology for that you know those concert based instruments uh, but we have not really delved into any kind of compromise uh, when it comes to the bell making process we are still doing everything that that you would expect to have happened 250 years ago uh, at this at the same time, so um, so with that said, it's so it's so interesting uh, because a lot of the perception of today is that we are a young company, right? We're oh BNS, you know, it's just now getting getting kind of started. Where we it couldn't be the more antithesis of that. So uh, if you think about 250 years, we have been making instruments. Um, if you think about 250 years, right? Uh, 1776 is when the United States basically made its, uh, its independence from, from England, from their settlers, right? And so in that case, we haven't actually hit that, that landmark, that 250 year landmark, uh, we're, we're about to, but um, the idea that we've been making instruments longer than the United States has been actually a country um, kind of says something, puts a little, little bit of perspective to, to what we're doing here. And 
um, it, it was for me at least, and I, I hope it is for you. Um, yeah, so uh, if you guys, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of open it up, but if you guys have any comments or questions, uh, I'd, I'd love to, to answer anything up until this point. Um, I'm gonna go continue because I see a lot of people chiming in. Thank you so much. Uh, I see Lori Orr, who's actually one of my colleagues up in the New York showroom uh, for our Buffet Crampon showroom. Uh, Andreas Gafke, who works in our Garrett Street facility. Hello, Andreas. Um, Don Zentz, who's actually one of our saxophone artists. Thank you so much for watching. Um, fantastic. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going. So uh, right now we're actually gonna move to where we started making trumpets in the traditional um, traditional sense of going after um, going after really the well going after really the uh, uh, the American sound or the American style, right? So uh, we were making German instruments and German trumpets and, and rotary trumpets up until about the 20, I'm sorry, up until about the 1980s. And um, then we wanted to really pursue the American market and uh, challenge the American competition at the time. And that that is great. And that's basically where the Challenger series was born. Um, and, and we took a lot of the elements from the French Bessons from the 1920s and, and really went after that sound, went after the, the, the idea of that specs, but made in, in the very much the German way, right? Um, so I hope that's all uh, very informative for you. Um, hi, Wesley, uh, thank you for your question. Actually, uh, that's a very good question. It is also a German, um, sorry, his question is, uh, be interested in what, the VEB stands for, um, and it's a very good question. It's actually not uh, an English translation, um, so I'd be I'd be very um, very interested in answering your question after after today's session. Uh, but no, I love I love love the idea and love the, the direction you're going. Um, so, uh, but that that refers to uh, what the company was before uh, before BNS became an entity within the the German. Um, the German government and the German uh, funding. And we can get into that for sure as well. Um, some of the entities going, some of these things going forward, it's really, really great. So um, yeah, yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much. You actually answered uh, Wesley's question. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna not pronounce your name, but Petter, uh, that's that's fantastic. Um, and that's right, so it's stately known. Stately owned uh, and, and a company in GDR. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, fantastic. We're gonna keep going, but the Challenger series was based off of the uh, the French Besson entity, right? So the Challenger one and Challenger twos kind of respectfully came out of that 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 area, and, and we're really um, we're really there. And the uh, photographer. Oh, sorry. Uh, Challenger Sears really wanted to be familiar to American players, and that's really the idea of the Challenger series. Um, so I'm I'm super excited about that. There are a few elements of our production that I'm I'm extremely excited to talk about, and I'd like to really figure out um, the uh, and really kind of partake into into what we're talking about today, and that's our apprenticeship program, something that no other real company does or no other real uh, country, I'm sorry, does in terms of how we train and really relate to our workers, right? So um, when we end up using our craftsmen in a way, shape or form, every craftsman who goes through our, our, our process or our training program uh, needs three years of, of experience uh, before they can even begin to work on on our instruments, right? Uh, so if you decide at any one point to go into a career and pursue uh, instrument making and instrument making process in Germany, you would go through this program called the apprenticeship program. And uh, you would be an apprentice for three years. Uh, you would learn how to make every entity of a brass instrument. That goes from the traditional way that we make our bells to the valve sections, to the tubings, to uh, bending, uh, bending the tubes themselves, drawing out lead pipes, making the valves, all of those processes, you actually make 100% uh, on your own before moving on to, uh, to, to being a, well, to being a professional, right? To being a craftsman, what we would consider a, a vocation. 
Um, so these are really important because um, at, that, at the end of that three year period of time, you're actually asked to produce an instrument 100% using your own hands. Like no one else touched it, no one else made that instrument. Um, yeah, so what's really important about that is that um, you would take that instrument and kind of present it to the master craftsman. You've been learning from these master craftsmen the entire time, and you would present this finished product to them and they would evaluate it for you. And um, it really speaks to the quality and the, uh, the German crafts. This is with any industry, by the way. It's not necessarily just manufacturing of instruments, but in any craft in Germany, you would be required to do this. Um, and it's kind of partly funded by the industry itself and partly funded by the government uh, that, that puts it on to, to create job opportunities for these people who, for, for their workers or for their, their population. Um, this is really, really great. Um, so uh, at the end of that three years, you can move into making, making instruments on, on a production line and working in the vocation that you've spent time training on. Um, and that's what makes German engineering, German craft, German uh, uh, quality products. And, and when we talk about German engineering for most every industry, that's what we're referring to. We're referring to the training process that everyone undergoes. Yeah. Um, very cool. Very cool um, stuff. So uh, Dan Morris. Uh, hey, Dan. It was it's great to see you on here on the Facebook Live. Um, what makes German brass better than others? Um, well, I kind of already sp spoke to it, but any vocation that you enter in Germany has that three year process before you're even able to begin your career. So I hope I answered your question uh, correctly. And, and it is a good question, uh, but most of the time when we talk about German engineering and German craftsmanship, it has everything to do with that process, right? Uh, where uh, not to say that it's always superior than any other product ever, in in the Amer in America or in, in in Asia or in any other part of the world, but it is its standards are to a higher level uh, than the lower standards in any any other area. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. So thank you. Great question. Cool. Um, absolutely. So moving on, I wanted to talk to a little bit about the products themselves and 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 really dive deep into what what we do. We talked about the traditional way of making bells and that we haven't compromised what that means uh, from 250 plus years ago. However, what does that really mean? Well, it means that we haven't used any modern technology. We haven't used machinery to help us go in a different direction. Um, and, and really we haven't compromised how we use any technology there. So there are three ways of making bells when we talk about brass instruments. Um, and, and these are general terms, just so that I can kind of explain it this way, but um, there are three ways, right? There's one, a one piece tube that we extrude into the shape of a bell, right? So there's no, it's a tube, starts out as a tube and then it ends as a tube that looks like a trumpet bell. Um, the second way to make a bell is two tubes, right? So we, to make them stronger and to make those tips of the bells uh, a lot less, well, a lot more durable for lack of a better term. We take two bells and we fuse them, to, or two tubes and fuse them together and then create the shape so that that second tube is thicker and can handle a lot more of the, um, that can handle a lot more, uh, well, a lot more damage. And, and those two elements we use mostly for uh, for student instruments, of course, because they're durable, they're a lot easier to um, to handle and, and everything, right? But they don't get the best sound. Um, so the third and last element of, of how we produce bells is actually out of a flat sheet of metal. Uh, what you might find in the auto industry, in fact, uh, all these sheets of metal that you form and, and put in these molds and put onto, onto the panels that end up being the panels to your car. Uh, it's the same sheet metal. We use the same supplier as some of the auto industry um, in Germany. So this is uh, this is actually pretty pretty great. The um, so it's the same. It's a flat sheet of metal, and then we cut out the design that's that's pre precursed, and we we've measured and made sure that that's the right design, and then we fold it in half um, slowly and and procured into a way that th then we can create a seam. What we call a Called, called that seam of a, of a bell. And um, that is soldered together um, and fused together rather with uh, 
um, hard soldered. And, and then we slowly uh, open the bell up through a process of annealing and hand hammering, right? Um, there are some, uh, some ways that you can speed up this process uh, while still using a flat sheet of metal, still using the, the fusing of the, the single seam bell, still using a lot of these elements that I'm talking about right now. Uh, but anytime you take machinery into the equation and, and mend, bell, mend the, the brass itself into a way that's kind of unnatural, um, you're losing character to the, to the bell, to the sound. And, and that's really, uh, really where I am going and where we are trying to stay, um, stay true to the traditional way of making bells, where we don't introduce any of those elements to our bell making process. Um, so literally a, a flat sheet of metal that is formed over time, going back and forth between annealing, which if I didn't mention, uh, annealing is the process of which you burn or, or heat um, the brass to a red hot heat. Uh, literally the, the brass gets red and, um, and it gets softer, right? So um, the more you anneal it, the more malleable that metal and brass can become. And then uh, you form that, and then you quickly, as it's red hot, you start shaping it with your hammer, uh, and then go back and forth. Right? The more you anneal, uh, the harder the the uh, the brass becomes, um, and vice versa. So it so it gets soft right now, but then as it cools, it gets harder. Um, so this is a, a happy medium between not getting too hard and not getting too too light or too too soft. After that process, uh, we've developed a lot of mandrels for our bell flares and bell shapes. And then uh, that finished um, or quasi finished bell, uh, which is now annealed and ready for finishing goes on to a, a mandrel for fine tuning. So it, it is at that point where we decide what thickness the bell is going to be and and what shape it's going to be. So um, when you talk about different bell flares, whether it's a large throat, small throat, um, quick flare, slow flare, uh, all those elements are decided after the bell has been annealed, gone through the annealing and hand hammering process. Yeah, and then we smooth smooth the bell out um, and and add the, the bell bead and the rim. And uh, and yeah, and then it finally becomes that, that hand hammered um, or that finished product that you see on, on modern trumpets today. Yeah, um, so it's hard to tell which bells have gone through this traditional process as a customer, as a you know, end user, um, or as right as a customer, as a as someone who's seeing the finished product, it's hard to see the differences between all these things, and that's why we want to we really want to get this information to you. There's a lot of great uh, videos about showing showing you how this is done, and uh, on our website and on our Facebook pages, we've got a lot of that stuff. I think we also have a YouTube uh, channel that's really devoted to giving you all that content as well. So um, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of resources that we could talk about right now um, that can certainly certainly help help explain what I'm trying to do from, from my dining room. So uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. If you're just now join, uh, tuning in, uh, I've got a lot of stuff to talk about and we've been talking about trumpets. We've been talking about BNS trumpets and the most recently the bell process um, of what, what, we, what we do. Yeah. Um, Okay, I wanted to go over a few common questions maybe that you guys have about the Challenger series and we'll get into everything now. So um, we went over what the traditional way, we went over three different types of bells, right? And uh, the apprenticeship program, which is all really val valuable. Um, oh, I see some, some questions come in, sorry. Uh, uh, Americano, I'm, I'm sorry, Americo uh, Guerrero, do B flat bells and C bells have the same shape and taper? Um, actually, no, uh, there are different sizes, different shapes and different, uh, bends to the actual bell bow that will, uh, will allow a C trumpet bell to be more resonant and more project, project a little bit better and, um, uh, than other than using a B flat for a C trumpet, you know, a B flat bell for a C trumpet. So, uh, no, there are very eclectic differences between the two. Um, and the details are, are really kind of finely tuned, uh, but there, there are differences in, in the design of these things. Yeah. Uh, so a C trumpet bell, while will resonate similarly, uh, 
it will it will also create some other intonation problems when you put it on a B flat bell and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, so B flat, C, E flat. We can talk about E flat bells too. Um, and on there, unless there's a certain uh, amount of design change on the front end of the horn, the design needs to be different on the back end of the bell, right? Uh, so it's a bit of a compromise. Every time we talk about cha making changes to one side of a horn, you have to make sure that the other side of the horn uh, reflects those same changes. Uh, otherwise, you will run into some some design issues. Yeah, uh, but good, really great question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, we talked about the Challenger 1 and the Challenger 2. I'd like to really kind of isolate the differences between the two, right? Um, that's the biggest question that I think we, we really get in the Challenger series. What What is the difference between a Challenger 1 and a Challenger 2? Is there something technical? Is there something um, physical or, or cosmetic? And and that's that's really easily answered in, in a few different ways, but uh, I'd like to go over those as well. So uh, with the Challenger 1 series, you really get, you know, what everyone um, what everyone really wants out of a trumpet, out of a, an all, all standard, you know, great playing horn that can do almost everything great, almost everything to, to a certain extent, right? So you can take this, it's a, for lack of a better term, it's a, a compromise in every direction, right? So it's a jack of all trades, master of none concept. Uh, so the Challenger 1 really goes after that, that person who's looking for someone for, who's looking for something that can that they don't know what they're doing in the future, right? So, um, so if you don't have an idea of if you're going to be an orchestral player or a jazz player or a concert, um, I'm sorry, a chamber chamber music player or a um, or a rock band, play, like if you don't know what you're you're going into at the very beginning, this is a perfect idea for you to go towards this challenge of one, um, and it. It features a gold brass lead pipe. Um, it, it got it has a lot of uh, a lot of great um, response. You get a you get a lot of response from the instrument, so that that immediate response is really important. And also, um, you get a really great sound with uh, what we would what we would do with all of our professional bells, which is the that that hand hammered traditional uh, way of, of making bells. Um, the other difference. Uh, but the differences between that and what we offer on our Challenger 2 is, is really the lead pipe uh, is the only difference as far as when we talk about technical differences of the, of the internal dimensions. So the lead pipe is a little bit more free-blowing. Um, and I say free-blowing, I mean it's a different taper that allows you to put more air into the instrument. Um, so if you really didn't want to ride on that much resistance, the Challenger 2 might be geared towards you a lot more than the Challenger 1 and vice versa. Um, the other differences is that you can make uh, a lot more customizations with the line. So the Challenger 2 really opens up a lot of options. So you have a, a different different bell flares, you have different bell weights, you have uh, different lead pipe design options for all of that stuff. So this is, this is really great. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. I see uh, Mark Pender just joined us. Um, thank you so much for, for joining in and, and having, in fact, talking about the Challenger 1. Uh, Mark Pender is a uh, BNS artist and he loves his Challenger 1, as you see there in the comments. He is a, um, he has been an iconic uh, TV uh, personality and, and, and his charismatic um, nature has been shown on the, the Conan show for Oh dear, I'm gonna I'm gonna not remember, but something like 30 years. Um, he mentioned at one point this past year that he's been over on over 4,000 episodes of uh, of the Conan O'Brien um, show, whatever it was, whatever uh, um, era that you were watching Conan. He's he's been on almost all almost every single episode. So that's uh, that's awesome. Thank you for joining us, Mark. And um, and obviously, Mark plays on a Challenger One. Uh, so it, it's not necessarily what we talk about as Challenger 1 and Challenger 2 as a better instrument. It's just different different strokes for different folks concept, yeah? And it depends on if you like more resistance or if you like it to be uh, more open or if you like different options when it comes to the del bell flares and you know exactly what you want in that area, you can go towards the Challenger 2. And, um, and there are also some physical differences 
that I can show you too. Um, so this is our challenger one. Um, hopefully I can show a little bit of these things, but um, the third valve stop is a rod stop, as you see here. On the Challenger 2, it's a screw stop. So um, just a, a few differences kind of like that. The valve caps are, are what we call the, the hard hard rubber um, uh, stops, right? So a lot of people like that versus uh, what we have on the Challenger 2, which is a, uh, a felt um, inlay on the valve on the valve caps. Uh, again, to each their, their own as far as what they like on those things. But some cosmetic issue or cosmetic differences are the only um, only, only the only thing there as far as a difference. Uh, the only real specification difference between the two are the lead pipe. So the lead pipe tapers is slightly different and the material is different too. So the Challenger one has a gold brass lead pipe. Uh, it's there to prevent some uh, some corrosive materials kind of forming. So gold brass always kind of helps hinder those kinds of materials from 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 appearing and then the challenger 2 has a yellow brass lead pipe um, and it's a slightly different taper as we talked about so the the yellow brass you would assume it responds a little bit more because you're opening up the resistance you need it to respond a little bit more at the front of the the attacks as well so uh, those are some of the differences between the challenger 1 and challenger 2. Uh, if you have any specific questions um, that would be that would be that would be great. I can answer them in the comments, or um, like I said before, I will be putting my information in the. Um, I'll be putting my information in the comments at the end of our, our session today. And if you have any questions after today or during the comments that I can't really answer, I will. Uh, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. This is going to be great. So uh, we talked about a few uh, differences in how they play. I can give you an example of some of the people who are playing these instruments too. Um, the Challenger 1 is actually uh, featured, you, you, you saw him here today, he's uh, listening, but Mark Pender plays uh, our Challenger 1, and so does a guy by the name of Wages Argot. He is actually, um, or, or was, the leader for the uh, Big Apple Circus, and some of the Barnum and Bailey circuses as well, um, and now he's doing a lot of uh, circus stuff in, in the New York and, and freelancing in the New York area, uh, which, is, which is great for him um and, and and everything so i know we're t we're all taking a break from from performing now but um yeah just love to to get back to to all these things um uh americo thank you so much for uh another great question um you you ask uh, are they made all made in germany or are you using pieces uh made in other countries that's a great question and no we don't make any um we don't we don't take any parts of our instruments from other countries or even other other manufacturers. We make everything in-house in Mark Nekirchen. Um, so, and Mark Nekirchen, Germany, in fact. So everything's made in Germany uh, on the east side of the country, just on the border of what used to be Bohemia, uh, which is in the Czech Republic. Yeah, this is a great question. And, and you know, not, not a lot of manufacturers can say that, which is, uh, which is really great and kind of positive for us. So everything is made in-house, yeah, up to the bracings, up to the uh, the lead pipes, the valve casing. We make everything. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, great. Sounds like you you play both. Uh, this is from America Guerrero. Um, you play both the Challenger One, and uh, and and it sounds great. So I'm I'm super happy to hear that. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, some some other artists that we were talking about earlier. This is really great. Uh, some other artists that are playing on the Challenger Two. Um, uh, just to go over a few, actually, is uh, Amy Gilreath. Amy Gilreath is a, a um, is a is a great great performer. She actually started and helped found the uh, Stiletto Brass Quintet, which is a, a touring group. Every every couple of weeks, they go out on tour and do these educational concerts and and clinics and 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 great. And all five brass players are um, our teachers. So Amy teaches at, um, at North, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting I'm getting everything confused, but she teaches at, uh, at University of Illinois um, in uh, uh, missing the, the town of the name, sorry. Uh, but she, she teaches at the university there in, um, in Illinois and she's fantastic. Um, and she plays on a Challenger 2, she plays on a lot of things. Obviously, her her sea trumpets are Challenger twos as well, 
Um, so I would implore you to kind of check their, them out as well. Uh, Kathy Leach, who is the professor at um, University of Te Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, and, and she's a great performer as well. She was actually, I think, the president of uh, ITG uh, for quite a while, our past president now, but she's um, she's been fully involved in the trumpet community and plays Challenger 2s as well. Um, yeah, uh, Joe Johnson, nice to see you here in the comments section. Uh, I see that you asked some questions here, so I'm just gonna, um, gonna read it out loud here. Uh, Challenger 2 has a six digit number on the mouthpiece receiver. What does that designate? Um, very good question, in fact, and I will certainly address it. I'm glad you asked it because it's on my list of things to go over. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you, thank you again. No, the six digit number actually on the mouthpiece receiver is actually your serial number. That is physically the serial number that we use to track every single instrument. Um, the, you will also find a six digit number on the valve casing itself, um, on the second valve casing. That is a number that is used strictly for productive, uh, I'm sorry, production purposes. And that's so that they can track some of the intricate quality concerns and, and things uh, after the fact. So um, if we ever have issues, which are very little in fact, but um, if we ever have issues that need to be addressed, we can track down certain lot numbers and, and things of, of in production. So if, if we've made adjustments, we can track whether or not that's been made in um, in, in terms of the, the, the valve casings themselves. So great question, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, the, the serial number is not on the valve casing, but is on the mouthpiece receiver. So yeah, uh, Chrissy Barda, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And I will, um, I will see your question. Actually, this is great. Uh, can you speak to the MBX line and in particular the MBX3? Um, Looks like you're a big band player and uh, doing some some soloing and looking for a new horn. Great, congratulations. Um, and that would fill the bill and if you have any other recommendations from the line. Wow, that's a, that's a great question. And yes, I can certainly talk about the MBX3, uh, which is what we have come to know to, to be uh, known as the Heritage Series, right? So we have the MBX Heritage is our um, newest member of the B-flat line and um came out a couple years ago i want to say 2017 um and it's it's been a great great success it features a lightweight 43 bell um so you get a lot more response with, with that horn uh you get a lot a lot of uh feedback from from the from the bell itself because we also feature it with a uh, a french bead uh the lead pipe is a reverse lead pipe specially made for christian martinez so Christian Martinez is a, a commercial player. He um, does a lot of studio and recording work out in Paris and, and all of France really is like one of the top calls over there. Uh, he helped design this particular instrument that we're talking about and, um, and it's great. Uh, it also features um, a trim kit with, with each horn. So you have the ability to kind of customize the balance of the horn and how how it responds to you, how it plays, how the uh, how the sound is created as well. You know, every time you change some kind of aspect to the horn, it will change the sound, of course. So, uh, great great question. I I, I would assume uh, that you're going to look at at the BNS uh, MBX Heritage, and um, I would I would compare it to. Uh, there's nothing really like it in our line uh, at the moment. And I would really compare it to some of our Challenger 1 uh, series um, instruments. Uh, play it side by side, uh, some of those things. You would probably um, find this to be a very good commercial horn, but it can, it can really be versatile, right? So you can, by changing some aspects of the horn with the trim kit, you can, you can really make it your own. It can be an orchestral horn if you want. I've used it in, in symphonies, I've used it in concert setting. So it's, um, it's a really great horn. Um, you should check it out. Um, there are some other instruments within the X line that uh, kind of speak to the same area. There's a, a guy by the name of Christian Jodas. He's a, uh, a BNS artist as well. He does a lot of Broadway shows. He also teaches at Juilliard as their jazz professor there. 
Um, and he plays on a JBX, which is named after him, uh, Christian Jadis. Um, and that features some of the same characteristics of the MBX heritage, but it's a, um, but, but it's a lighter weight horn. So you don't get that heavy traditional sound. It's very vibrant in your hand. So, um, yeah, there's just very different, uh, different in terms of certain things, but you can, you can certainly feel the differences of how they respond to each other. Yeah. Um, cool. Oh, sorry. I, I made the mistake. Uh, Doug earlier. So um, thank you for, for tuning in, even though it's your wife's account. Uh, fantastic. So um, I, I very much uh, thank you for your question. It was, it was great. Uh, depending on where you are, there are several different places to check out the, the instruments. I would implore you to look at our website, our BNS website, um, which is going to show you all of our, our dealers who can, who can supply you the instrument, of course, but uh, contact them to see if they are um, if they have any in stock, if they have any to, to show. Um, and also if you're in the New York area, uh, especially after, you know, we're done with all this, um, COVID-19 stuff, uh, we have our New York showroom, which is just in the heart of Manhattan. And it's a great place to go to try out everything we talked about. Um, our New York showroom, uh, manager is here actually in, in the chat. So, um, uh, she, her name is Lori Orr. And she'd be happy to help you set up an appointment for, for when all this stuff is over and we're back to normal. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much. Great. Um, a few other artists that I wanted to kind of go over and who are playing on our Challenger 2 series, uh, are Joey Tartell. He teaches at the, uh, universe, I'm sorry, Indiana University, uh, Jacobs School of Music. Um, he's a, a great advocate of the horns. He plays on a heavyweight bell, uh, 43, um, he likes that because he doesn't, he feels like he doesn't need help playing high. He's got that kind of co covered. So, but he needed something to really uh, give him some core in the sound. So he plays on a heavyweight, um, heavyweight 43 bell, uh, part of our Challenger 2 series. Yeah. Um, the last and certainly not least um, person I wanted to kind of talk about is Philip Cobb. Uh, for those of you in the trumpet world, you should know this name, but if you don't, he is the principal trumpet for the uh, London Symphony Orchestra. Um, I'm sorry, uh, the London Philharmonic Orchestra. He is the, uh, I mean, he has a lot of roots back into the brass banding stuff. He started as a cornet player and then uh, traditionally has won um, the, the winner of the, uh, of those or orchestral editions for the London Philharmonic have been traditionally uh, British British band players, British brass band players. Anyway, it's Maurice Murphy is a, is a great example. Uh, before him was also a British, British player, uh, or sorry, a cornet player. And uh, so Philip made his kind of cut his teeth playing with, um, with the Cory band and with, with all these brass, great brass band player, players uh, and playing mostly cornet. Um, so when he won the gig, he played, uh, had to play trumpet of course, and uh, got on board with our challenge or sorry, our Challenger 2 series with a slightly different lead pipe. He's got his own um, development there that we worked on with him and it was really great. So uh, thank you so much for, for, for that. Um, the X line, which is, uh, we talked a little bit about the MBX heritage and the JBX. Uh, our X line was developed, is developed closely with any of our artists, right? So we mentioned Chris Jodis being very uh, heavily into developing the JBX, which is a great instrument. Uh, and also Christian Martinez developing the MBX Heritage Series, uh, which is also a great instrument. And something I didn't mention, uh, Doug, uh, that the Heritage Series also implies or also encompasses is a, a plethora of different and very unique finishes. So I don't know what kind of player you are, um, but if you, are drawn to some uniqueness to your sound and also the look of your horn. Uh, there are some really, really beautiful finishes that we've come up with over there on the chat on the uh, MBX Heritage Series. So uh, one is our vintage finish, which we've been doing on our saxophones for uh, a long time uh, from Kyleworth. And the Kyleworth factory, believe it or not, is just down the road in the same town we've been talking about in Mark McCurshin. And so we've been using that same process to make some of our trumpets, in fact, too. So the MBX Heritage comes in our 
uh, vintage finish, which is a beautiful finish. It's basically an, uh, a bath that we put in um, for a certain amount of time and it reacts literally to the brass itself and kind of patin patinas it, for lack of a better term, um, in, in a way that's very unique to that instrument. Like the brass itself has different patterns. Um, so each time you use um, each, each instrument that goes into the bath will, will react differently. So no two instruments will look exactly alike when they come out of the bath. So the longer we leave it in there, the darker the patina gets. Um, and then, and then, yeah, so it's a beautiful instrument. And we also have our gold brass, uh, gold, I'm sorry, our, uh, brushed gold lacquer, uh, finish, which is also very unique. I don't think anyone in, in the industry is doing something like this. Um, but it's a, we basically put the trumpet before it's finished into a tumbler sort of a machine and uh, shoot little beads at it, right? So it's a bead blasted finish, uh, it kind of resembles a dryer, this big machine. Um, and we shoot beads at it until it gets a uniform finish on the outside. And then we put a light layer of gold lacquer, which is a beautiful finish in, in any, in any horn, uh, without the bead blasted. But, um, yeah, we put a light layer of gold lacquer on top and it's beautiful. Um, so check out our website there and you can find both of those finishes there uh, as well. So I want to make sure I didn't miss anything here. Uh, Werner Richter, thank you so much for your, uh, for your presence here. Thank you for watching. Um, it's been a, been a while since we, we caught up and, uh, yeah. So you want me to talk about the production of BNS and how they ensure consistency in the production of trumpets. Um, we spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I'm happy to go over it again. This is uh, really important, and I'm, I applaud you for the question. It's really great. Um, so we we take a few steps to make sure that the consist consistency between the two are really, really great. Um, so the the biggest thing that we do on, on two elements of this is actually the apprenticeship program, um, where one one person who wanted to enter the craft really only uh, can do so by, by through this program, right? So uh, it takes them three years to really get all the training that they need. And, and then they take that training or that knowledge that they've gained from master craftsmen uh, in our Garrett's Reed uh, facility, which if I didn't mention, we have a research and development facility in Garrett's Reed, which is about an hour, 45 minutes or to an hour uh, outside of Munich. And um, so that's where we do all of our training. That's where we have all of our R&D um, research and development teams working on new projects and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and that's where you would get trained and work. And so you would work, uh, you would tr get your training for three years. And then after that three year period of time, you would present an instrument that has only been touched by your hands. And um, no one is allowed to work on our, our line, on our, on our instruments in Mark Nekirchen, um, without this, this kind of training, without this, uh, this certificate or this uh, approval from, from the government and from the, um, from, from the government. Yeah. So um, that's one element. And also uh, the materials that we use because of all of that program that we, that we talk about because of that, we are allowed, we are able to be as consistent as possible from one, one to the next. So even in the brass that we receive from our suppliers, uh, which is the same supplier that uh, gives their products or that the auto industry receives for their paneling and stuff like that. Uh, so it's very, it's high quality tubes, high quality uh, sheets of metal, sheets of brass. So um, this is, it's industry wide, right? Um, and, and, and speaks to how how great these products can be and um, someone asked me why uh, the products are are to that level um, the consistency speaks to the workers and the quality of the brass speaks to how how it, it is relevant to other entities so our brass supplier and the people working to create that brass at its highest quality are also going through these steps in this apprenticeship program in their own industry and how to create brass and, and make these alloys and, and make them as high quality as they can. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, right. 
Yeah, you're right. I'm, I am sorry. I did misspeak. Um, thank you so much, Colby. Uh, yes, Amy Gilreath does teach at Illinois, um, Illinois State in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the correction. Uh, I'm having a, a little bit of a brain fart during that, that se section of the session. Um, thank you for correcting me and for everyone else out there. Yes, uh, Amy Gilreath is one of our artists who teaches at University of Illinois um, in Bloomington. So uh, not University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Sorry, I, I didn't ever mean Ur University of Illinois in Urbana Champaign, um, but I, I know my words didn't come out that right. So thank you so much for the correction. Um, and yeah, uh, there one of us. Yeah, um, I wanted to go over a few things before we go continue. Um, but thank you so much for for all of your comments and everything. Um, before we before we really conclude today's session, if you have any questions, please by by all means, um, I'm happy to answer as much as I can here. Um, also, uh, we have something new to show you and to to really kind of dive deep into. And I'd like to take the last few minutes that we have to to really go over that for you. Um, and it's called our Metropolitan Series. Um, so we've gone over the Challenger 1, the Challenger 2, the X-Line, which is uh, that artist-inspired series. Um, this new series is the Metropolitan Series. We've, uh, we've announced it at NAMM um, this past year, which is the North American uh, Music Merchants Conference in January. Um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great show, uh, but uh, this is where we announced Kind of the the underlying idea of, of what we're going to going to talk about and it's the metropolitan uh series the first of which is going to be a sea trumpet and um this series is really to go after those american players um who are looking for an orchestral setup right so um and not necessarily orchestral within the series but in this idea it's really to go after american design and american um players uh, because a lot of what we've done so far within the challenger series was even though the specs uh speak to american players it was still designed by our team in germany so this is the first time we've really taken some american design efforts into the making of our instruments and um and that partnership uh and there's, there's a great partnership here to, to speak about and i'd like to to really introduce that so yeah, um, in fact, he just chimed in. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go go forth with it. But uh, Josh Landers and BNS have partnered together to create the Metropolitan series. Uh, Josh Landers is a huge name in the industry. Um, he is a master technician. Uh, he's got a, a huge um, amount of, of passion and and great knowledge base uh, with everything music. I think. If I read it correctly, he started when he was six years old, um, started playing the horn, if I'm not mistaken, at age 11. Um, and, and really his career took off into a, a different direction, um, but in, in terms of his passion for music and music making and bringing people of the community into, um, into to really making a, a difference in the community, he's, he's been great and um, his design knowledge and his uh, ideas and, 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 and things have been, been just wonderful for, um, for all the trumpet community, not just BNS. But uh, we approached Josh about two years ago about creating, um, creating a, a new sea trumpet. We've been uh, kind of having a new prototype on the, on the table for, for quite a while now. And so we showed it to him. I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Josh just chimed in. He was repairing instruments when he was 13. So uh, fantastic! This is awesome. Uh, so fantastic! We were uh, we were talking to Josh about two years ago and presented the the prototype that we had for the sea trumpet. And he basically took took one look at it, said like, "Look, the craftsmanship is pristine. This is great. There's everything is doing that you're doing in the production side of things is really great. But I want to change everything if we we talk about this partnership." And um, two years later, we we're at a at a part um at, at a time where we can actually announce something um and we were going to put all this stuff into our um uh, our presence at itg and and really have uh, a great presence there uh but since uh covid19 happened we were unable to so i'm gonna try and uh recreate that kind of experience for you um so 
Uh, as you see, the sea trumpet in the background is also one of these magnificent horns, but this is the Metropolitan Sea Trumpet in my hands. Um, a few features of this trumpet uh, will be, uh, well, there's there's four of them, right? So um, one is a two-piece valve section. We haven't done that before on our trumpets. Um, we've really stuck to the one-piece valve section. Um, and I can I can I can speak to that until I'm blue in the face and we can we can really nerd out. We really want to talk about that. But um, two-piece valve section, um, it's a lighter weight valve section. So um, if you take a look, I'll, I'll do this for you so you can see. Uh, but if you take a look at the valves themselves, they've been skeletonized, what we're calling a skeletonized system on the valve stems and also underneath the, um, I don't know if that's focusing correctly, but um, underneath the, uh, it's been bored out underneath the, the valve. And also the Monel itself is actually a, a, a lightweight system, a lightweight alloy. Um, also, uh, it's a brand new look. Uh, we've got a new leak pipe design, uh, a new bell design. It's a side seam bell. Um, and yeah, so it's a brand new look. There's only uh, a few things that we've we've um, kept from the original series on the Challenger Challenger 2. Um, so the mouthpiece receiver is brand new. The everything is kind of a, a groundbreaking uh, from the ground up, a, a completely new design. Thanks to Josh on on this whole whole uh, program and, and concept. So the, the next thing I wanted to talk about actually has everything to do with um, being able to, to, to bring this to, to focus, right? So um, we talk about uh, this being an American design uh, a lot, but what does that really mean? So we wanted it to be an orchestral instrument. So we, we approached a lot of those who are deep into the orchestral um, uh, realm, right? So a lot of the, the great players in the New York, greater New York area are, are part of that um, and and got their feedback and asked them, hey, check this trumpet out. Let me know what you think. And we tweaked a lot of the bracing, a lot of the materials that are involved in this. Um, and Josh, you could probably speak to this a lot more than than I am about to, uh, but maybe we can, we can just delve really deep into that at a, at a later time. I am um, going to talk really, really quickly about what we came up with. It's a uh, harmonic balancing system. Uh, so Josh really kind of tweaked a lot of the experimental parts of this uh, with what we call pull knobs, right? So these are, I don't know if you could see that, but uh, on every trumpet on the first, third, and sorry, first, second, and third slide are these things called pull knobs. It's really there so that you can pull out the valve slide, right? A little easier than, than just trying to, trying to pull the slide itself. Um, they're also acoustically kind of situated in that that area so that you know the the horn responds and and plays in tune and and, and all that as well uh, but also uh, he played around with different shapes different sizes different weights of of all of these and um, and found out that they did different things not necessarily good or bad in one direction and so um, we came up with a modular system where um, all these screw off. So you have a, a modular system where, um, I don't know if you can see that, but that is the pull knob. I just took it off of the horn. And what we'll do is provide a few different, um, a different weights. So you'll have a medium weight set, a, a heavier weight set, and the normal set that would normally come on your instrument uh, to help fine tune some of those intricate details regarding response, um, in some terms, intonation. And like we said before, Anytime you take away or add brass or more weight or, or less weight to an instrument, you're inevitably changing how you will sound. Um, so this is uh, the new design, the new um, the new concept of the Metropolitan C trumpet. Um, and and yeah, so this is the first of many among the series. And I hope uh, once we get done with all of our social distancing. Um, you guys can all check it out in in person and and at your your local music store or in uh in whatever festivals that that are local to you or at itg or um or anything like that so uh this is really exciting for us it's really exciting for me personally uh but more importantly um it's we just want to get it into your hands so um thank you so much i'm gonna end the session now uh after after that i hope i got to all of your questions and i hope if there's anything um if there's anything that you have for me please reach out to me directly um 
my email is, uh, as I see it just uh, appearing right now, is, is in the thread in the comments. So just uh, reach out to me with any questions, comments, or concerns that you have. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, this has been our Q&A webcast series uh, as part of the Together at Home uh, program. Uh, please check out all the rest of the co uh, content that we're about to create and have created already on our Facebook pages and um, visit our websites for more information on our products. But, uh, but really, thank you so much for watching. Um, the next uh, webcast will be on Thursday, hosted by Matt Vance, our woodwind product specialist, and it'll be based off of um, our Buffet Crampon and Julius Cowworth saxophones. That will be hosted on our Buffet Crampon Facebook page, and you'll see announcements in the next day or two if you wanted to uh, receive some of that stuff. So thank you so much for your time. And, um, and yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.